Welcome to this video on surgical decision making in septorhinoplasty. Before we begin, consider the following questions. What is Anderson's tripod theory? What are the major and minor tip support mechanisms of the nose? What factors determine the decision between an open versus a closed septorhinoplasty? What are some of the common post septorhinoplasty deformities? What is Anderson's tripod theory? This is a commonly asked question and an important consideration when undertaking rhinoplasty, particularly through an open approach. It refers to the support of the nasal tip, where the lower lateral cartilages make up the different legs of a so-called tripod. The lateral crura of the right and left side respectively make two legs of the tripod and the conjoined medial crura makes up the third leg. As one side is lengthened or shortened, it will have an effect on rotation and projection of the nose. For example, to shorten and rotate a totic or droopy nose, one can cut and overlap the lateral crura on either side, thereby rotating and deprojecting the nose. If, however, you want to simply deproject the nose without any rotation, then simultaneously you would also need to cut the medial crura as well, called a medial crural overlay, as all limbs of the tripod would then be shortened equally. What are the major and minor tip support mechanisms? I always think of the major tip support mechanisms as involving the lower lateral cartilages. They consist of the size, shape and resilience of the medial and lateral crura. Two, the scroll ligaments between the lower and upper lateral cartilages, and three, the attachment of the medial crural foot plate to the caudal septum. What are the minor tip support mechanisms? These comprise the following, the skin and soft tissue envelope, the membranous septum, the dorsal cartilaginous septum, the interdomal ligaments, the lateral sesamoid cartilage and the anterior nasal spine, essentially everything else related to the structure of the nose. What factors determine the decision between an open versus a closed septorhinoplasty? This is ultimately a personal decision and will depend in large part on training and experience, but also on what you are trying to achieve. A closed approach is broadly divided into non-delivery and delivery approaches. The non-delivery approach involves an incision at the intercartilaginous area and is combined with a conventional septoplasty hemitransfixion incision, which in turn is converted to a full or partial transfixion incision to expose the whole septum and nasal dorsum. It permits good views of the dorsum with no external scars. Spreader grafts and mid-third augmentation can be carried out this way, as well as dehumping and osteotomies. But in order to undertake major tip work, a delivery approach is needed. A delivery approach utilizes the same previously described incisions, but additionally marginal incisions are also made to expose the lower lateral cartilages. These are combined with the previous intercartilaginous incisions and the lower lateral cartilages are brought out and exposed fully in order to carry out tip work, thereby avoiding a scar at the base of the nose. In an open approach, there is a small staggered incision at the base of the nose, which is combined with internal marginal incisions to expose the whole nasal framework. All rhinoplasty maneuvers can be carried out this way, and for patients with very caudal deviations, and major asymmetry, it permits far superior views. There are clearly pros and cons to both approaches. In terms of the closed approach, there is no scar and in general quicker healing, particularly if no tip work has been carried out. However, particularly in delivery surgery, it is more technically challenging and grafting can be more tricky. In patients with very twisted mid-thirds, large tip asymmetries heavy, thick skin and weak underlying cartilage, a closed approach may not be most suitable. What are some of the most common post-rhinoplasty deformities? 
A saddle nose deformity is something that we have spoken about before, and this may also be associated with a septal perforation after surgery. A polybeak deformity refers to the appearance of a parrot's beak. This is due to excess tissue in the supratip and can be cartilaginous in nature, a so-called cartilaginous polybeak from excess dorsal septum left behind in the supratip, or a soft tissue polybeak characterized by excess scar tissue following surgery. An open book deformity is where conventional Joseph D. Humping has been carried out, leaving a flattened appearance of the nasal bones. If lateral osteotomies are not carried out to close the open roof, it can leave a widened and unsightly appearance of the nasal bones. An inverted V deformity is an unwanted complication of the middle vault. It classically arises from an over-resection of the cartilaginous portion of a dorsal hump. As its name suggests, the mid-third of the nose gives rise to the appearance of an upside-down V. The skin overlying the middle third is often thin, making irregularities hard to conceal. Aside from the undesirable aesthetics, there is often a functional component with disruption of the nasal valve. Once a cartilaginous dehump is carried out with disarticulation of the septum from the upper lateral cartilages, it is necessary to reconstruct the mid third. This can be done with spreader grafts or auto spreader flaps. I hope you found this video to be useful. Please consider subscribing and let us know what you'd like us to cover next.